Welcome to the Heart of Innovation, 60 minutes that can save life and limb with new breakthrough ideas and innovation changing the healthcare landscape. Brought to you by patient advocacy group, thewaytomyheart.org, in partnership with Cardiovascular System Incorporated's patient advocacy campaign, Take a Stand Against Amputation. Here are your hosts for the Heart of Innovation, Emmy Award-winning journalist and founder of The Way to My Heart, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist and founder of the Save My Piggies Health Education Series, Dr. John Phillips. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. How much easier would it be if we had instant access to our medical records, especially imaging so we can make those real-time decisions on our care and even get a second opinion in a timely manner well the reality is that although hipaa mandates our right for access to our medical records get copies of them and request um, them to have some changes made policies differ depending on the facility which end up hindering a patient's ability to get access in real time. Some even charge to release the records, asking patients to cover the so-called administrative costs of putting them together and shipping them out, or even having them available. Some even wait until the very last moment to send under HIPAA's 30-day requirement between the time the request was made and honored. And even some take advantage of a one-time 30-day extension, further delaying the release of records. And that delay in getting those records to all of us really could cost our life and our limb. But there is some light on the horizon. Coming up on today's show, we are going to talk about the new Cures Act, as well as other innovation happening around medical records access that could provide unprecedented power to the patient. Leading today's discussion, of course, is my co-host, Dr. John Phillips. Nurse practitioner Kay Smith is here from The Way to My Heart. Also joining the discussion is Bill Anderson, advisor to DigiCare, which is creating an advanced platform to democratize access to patient records. He's also the VP of Partnerships for BRIA, which allows patients, physicians, and researchers, as well as data analytics tools to be able to access, make sense of all that data found in those medical records. Um, I wanna make sure Bill can hear us. Bill, can you hear us? I can hear you, can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, fantastic, yay, we got him. <laughs> but we hope <laughs> we're gonna get to the topic of the day in just a few, few moments, but once we check in with everyone and before we jump into everything, Dr. Phillips, your words of inspiration for the day. Dr. John Phillips, spectacular, vascular moment of inspiration. Our producer Aikman just nailed that. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow, Aikman, fantastic. Uh, these are going to be some awesome words of inspiration. Kim, how are you doing? How's everybody today? And our uh, other producer, Mike Matthews, uh, commiserated Mike on that one. Fantastic. This is great. I, you know, this show I'm really looking forward to because, you know, information, as Albert Einstein said, is not always knowledge. So it's 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 I'm, I'm looking forward to engaging patients today as, as well as Bill with respect to the notion of all this kind of unprecedented access to, to medical information because patients have a right to know, um, but they, they get kind of confused a little bit with respect to the verbiage and the language that we use when we talk amongst ourselves. However, moving forward, we need to have a good quote from the day for the day. And I always love Winston Churchill. And this quote is about information because that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. And Winston Churchill said, true genius resides in the capacity for evaluation of uncertain, hazardous and conflicting information. Now, we don't necessarily think about our, our health care or the, the ailments that we have as uncertain or, or, or maybe conflicting. They can be a little bit hazardous. But the point of that quote in my mind is there's a lot of kind of uh, what is it kind of medical legal like soup that comes out of some of the things we say that can confuse patients. And so once they get this information from whomever is taking care of them, they need someone to kind of help translate. And I think Bill's going to maybe share what, uh, what, what, what he knows about that. But at any rate, I like that quote and I'm looking forward to, to this uh, conversation today. Yeah, no, that was a fantastic quote. I can't wait to get into it, but we should, 
Everyone have a good week. I know for me, this week was huge. And speaking of information and really trying to democratize it for patients, one of the things that patients find so difficult is when a doctor says, hey, you need to go and you need to change your diet. So what we were able to do with The Weight of My Heart is we released our very first 94-page publication, um, which is a comprehensive handbook for patients to work with their dietitians and nutritionists and other clinicians and physicians to really get a better understanding of what are the diet options out there, um, how do we customize it for you, and then provide a practical accountability like with worksheets and things like that that they can go home, they can fill out, they can bring back. And it just makes it so that patients can truly engage um, in, in their care and feel empowered as well. So we're really excited about that. That's awesome. How long did that take you guys to put that together? Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh, since uh, February. Yeah. And it was a yeah. great partnership. You know, Dr. Michael Danzinger, um, mm -hmm. we haven't announced this yet. We haven't made a big public, but he is now the medical director um, for The Way to My Heart. He's also the medical director for Advanced Diagnostics, Boston Heart Diagnostics. And he played a huge role in um, providing a lot of information. And it took a lot of time to compile what damages the arteries cholesterol 101. What are the foods that damage and then heal the arteries? And all kinds of, of things. So it's really chock full. It's not exhaustive, but definitely comprehensive. That's awesome. Kim, I just have to, I have one more thing I, I want to share or state, you know, we've been doing the show since what June and the intro I love, and it, and it starts with you because this is, you know, you're, you're the, the quarterback of the show and it says Emmy award-winning. And I always get jealous because like, I obviously don't have an Emmy, but how do I get an Emmy? And how, how did you get your Emmy? I got to ask. <laughs> You know, it was literally how many years in the making? I mean, I've been in broadcasting for 22 years, I think now. Um, it, it's the holy grail, I think, for That's me right. when it came to broadcasting. And it took me three times before I ended up, I submitted, I was three times nominated. Every time I ended up submitting, I would be nominated. But then what was so amazing about ending up winning this Emmy, it was for my interview skills. And that was really huge. It meant the world to me. Um, not only, I was the only one nominated. When you have an Emmy um, competition or judging, those judges don't have to nominate anyone in any category. They, they don't have to, not one of them might be Emmy worthy. And the fact that mine out of more, to, more than several dozen, you know, mine was the only one that was Emmy worthy in that category and I won it. And it was just so awesome. And then, you know, God bless my mom, um, rest in peace, but she was able to be there for that when I received it. And I actually, when I came down from the stage, I said, no, this isn't mine. This is yours. And I appreciate you so much. And same for my dad, because they're the ones who raised me. They're the ones who were my strength and my foundation. So oh, that, that's, that's awesome. And then that plays right into your interview skills for our show. So this is awesome. Well done. <laughs> Definitely. Well, coming up right here on the Heart of Innovation, um, hosted by, no, I'm just kidding. Um, we are going to get into the topic of the day and talk about how to get access uh, to our medical records more easily. So stay with us. Leg health can indicate risk for heart attack, stroke, and amputation. If you have leg pain or cramps while walking, get checked for peripheral artery disease, or PAD. PAD is plaque buildup in mainly the leg arteries. Be sure to ask your physician for an ankle brachial index, also called an ABI test, where they use blood pressure cuffs to analyze the blood pressure in your legs. If they discover you have arterial plaque that's limiting blood flow to your feet, medicine and a regimented walking program are frontline treatment. If PAD is in its advanced stages, your physician may schedule a surgical intervention. Minimally invasive tools are available to remove plaque and restore blood flow, including cardiovascular system's Diamondback 360 atherectomy system, which sands away plaque that is a hard calcium. It's important to discuss all options with your physician, and if told you have no options, get a second opinion. Take a stand against amputation. For more information, go to standagainstamputation.com. That's standagainstamputation.com. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. 
once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. How much easier would it be if we had instant access to our medical records, especially imaging, so we could make those real-time decisions on our care and even get a second opinion in a timely manner? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today. We have a very special guest with us. We have Bill Anderson. He is an advisor to DigiCare, which is creating a platform that at its foundation democratizes access to all medical records for patients across facilities. Also with a special algorithm, helps patients to make sense of some of the really tough medical terminology that they may not be familiar with. He's also the VP of Partnerships for BRIA, which allows patients and physicians and researchers and all of those data analytics tools, the geeky stuff, to be able to access and make sense of the data from any location and any format in real time. Bill, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of this. I love the show, and, and this is such a great honor to, to be hanging out with you guys today. Yeah, we're talking about all of the gaps in healthcare where, seriously, we just can't get access to our records in a timely fashion, the problems that transpire because of it. But I want to touch on there is a slight solution on the horizon, the new Cures Act, Correct. Sure. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really this this started the 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 Cures Act was passed back in twenty end of twenty sixteen. So it's been something that's been really underway for a couple of years now. The thing that's important is as of October sixth, there was a mandate that made sure that everybody who has medical information, whether they're physicians or hospitals or pharmacies or home care organizations, all of those people are now required to make medical records available to people. So, and if they don't, if you try to get your records and they block you from getting that information, they face fines, fines of up to a million dollars for every situation where they keep you from getting your records. So it is a very, very strong message and and indication that the government is really pushing to get this stuff done. But you kind of hit the nail on the head and, and Dr. Phillips did as well, that even though this, this, is all in motion and we're really starting to see some some great gains from this there's still a lot of challenges because data still is in a lot of different structures it, it's kind of in different places and it's hard to get so and then on top of that just like dr phyllis said even if you get the the information sometimes it's confusing and i can tell you you know just even though i'm somebody who who has a medical background it can be very, very hard to really understand all of these different things and how they work together and understand the role that you play as a patient or, or as a parent in trying to make decisions about how to help your family through these kind of medical situations. So I think it's a great first step, but I think there's a lot of great things that are coming down the road that are going to make it even better in the next couple of years. And, and Bill, this is all about transparency. Um, and I think this is a the Cures Act is going to is opens a lot of doors doors for people um i you know we, we're going to hopefully get some patients to to call in and share some personal stories i had a story with a with a patient who now they have access to the, the progress notes we call them progress notes that's just the the office visit and, and kind of the verbiage and that we use to describe what's going on in the physical exam and what our plan is so normally patients weren't really able to see those and some don't necessarily want to, but, you know, patients were are, are looking at those. And, and I brought a patient in for a procedure to fix a blockage in, in a, a leg artery. She was having a lot of symptoms. And, uh, you know, I, I said in my note, patient, uh, unfortunately, continues to smoke. So the durability of this procedure uh, may, may be a little bit shortened. And, uh, you know, I don't think anything of it when I say things like that, because we're just trying to convey information to the referring physician, the physician that sent that patient to us. And the patient came into the, the cath lab that day and I said, how are you doing, man? She said, I'm mad at you. I said, why is that? So, well, you said and, and you said that, uh, you know, this this isn't going to work because I keep smoking. And I said, well, I didn't necessarily mean it like that. But we do know that if you continue to smoke, it's not going to last as long. She said, well, you know what? I quit smoking. <laughs> I'm like, well, awesome. <laughs> this, I didn't necessarily Good know that that's going to be the outcome, but that's fantastic. So she took it and spun it in the right way. But people can spin this information in, in the wrong way. So, again, buyer beware, in my opinion. I, I no, couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. I, I, 
think it's, you know, and, and it's so, it's one of the things that's so important about the work you've done, Kim, with the, you know, that, that 94 page book that you put together, because there's some, some translation there of the language of medicine, but also it really puts the patient in the driver's seat and it helps them to be responsible for their health. And I think that's the thing that often is missing in this situation is you have the, have some of this information, but if you don't have that agency, if you're not in a position to be able to use it and to be able to make things better for yourself, then it really can be difficult. And, and there's still a lot of things that, that surround these kind of decisions um, that make it very, very difficult. I'll, I'll tell you a story. I've got a, a daughter. I'm actually at her soccer game right now, which is going to start in another 15 minutes. But, um, but she was five years old, and, and we were sitting at the breakfast table having eaten our cornflakes. And I noticed she was looking at me with one eye and out the window with the other eye. And I said, this isn't a normal thing to see. And so and ended up going to the eye doctor. And the eye doctor said, I could see on his face. He was concerned. And I knew what he was thinking was she had a brain tumor. And I said, listen, if this is your doctor or your daughter, what do you do? He says, I go get an MRI today. I get out there and get this as fast as I can and get, get in front of this. But of course, the challenge for me is I called my insurance company. They said, well, you need a second opinion. Oh, it's going to be 30 days until we can go through the paperwork and do this stuff. And, you know, I had some knowledge and some information, but I still was stuck. I was still in a situation where I had to really fend for myself. And the thing that's funny about it is I called the imaging center and I asked them, what does it take to get in? You know, how much do you charge my insurance company? They said, it's about $4,000. And I said, okay, what is it if I pay cash? And the other person seemed to drop the phone and they picked it up. They said, cash. And I said, yeah, what if I came in and they said, we could get you in today and it's $700. And I said, really? Wow. And I realized that there's so much information we don't have that we struggle to make these decisions as consumers of, you know, of medical care. And we went in got the, the, the procedure done. Fortunately, my daughter was fine. It was a, a minor surgery. She got fixed right up and everything was great. But okay. it was fascinating to me that, that there's this information that, that you just don't know. And you're making some of these decisions and you're really blind. And so the tools that you're putting together, Kim, and, and the ability to take this information, and just like that Winston Churchill go quote, I love it, you know, being in a situation where the information is, is usable and you put yourself in a situation where people can actually benefit from this with the transparency, with the understanding, and then with the tools to be able to turn that into you know, better health. I think that's the future. And I, I'm very excited about that. And I'm curious, just even from Dr. Phillips' perspective, just being a physician, have you ever had a situation where uh, you've had a patient, time is tissue, they're about to lose their leg because they have blocked arteries in a chronic issue called peripheral artery disease. And you just wish you had access right then to the records from the other facility, but the other facility is dragging their feet. They won't release it in real time to the patient. And you're sitting here, you're going in blind into one of these procedures and you don't know what to expect. We had a situation where we had a patient who said, I've never had an angioplasty or stent before. Never. And it, the doctor goes in while I'm there and it's like, lo and behold, there's a big old stent in there. And we're like, um, hello. She said, oh, well, I just thought it was a diagnostic. I didn't know they did anything. Have you had a situation like that where you're sitting here going, why couldn't they get me these records today? Uh, yeah. I mean, it happens regularly. And, and, and I don't think people are necessarily dragging their feet, but it's just things move very slowly. Like, you know, an aircraft carrier takes a while for it to turn. And that's kind of what we're used to. I'd love to share more of that, that story when, when we come back from the break. My symptoms started with leg pain and leg cramps while walking. Me too, with a tightness in my calves. Well, do you know, my doctor thought that my leg cramps were a side effect of the statin he prescribed me. Well, my doctor just brushed them off as another symptom of old age. Mine thought the pain was radiating from my spine. My doctor blamed my neuropathy on diabetes until I got a wound on my foot that just wouldn't heal. Yeah, it turns out we all have peripheral artery disease, also known as PAD. It's plaque buildup mainly in the leg arteries causing poor circulation. For me, the diagnosis came too late and I lost my leg, but that does not have to happen to you. 
No, it does not, because there are treatment options available if you're diagnosed early enough. PAD, peripheral artery disease. If you've been experiencing leg pain, leg cramps or neuropathy when walking and your doctor isn't hearing you, we are. We are the way to my heart, the largest support network for peripheral artery disease patients. And we want to help you get back on your feet again. Visit our website at thewaytomyheart.org or call our Legsaver hotline 415-320-7138. Your life and limb could depend on it. Welcome back to the Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Today, we are talking about innovation and ideas around the timely access for patients uh, with their medical records. We have the new Cures Act, which Bill Anderson, which DigiCare, and Bria uh, has been talking about. Um, Bill Anderson, so tell us, where are the gaps still, though, in terms of even having the new Cures Act, in terms of these patients still getting timely access to their records, especially imaging? Where where do we have the hang up still? And maybe where your companies are coming in to try and innovate around that. Great question. And and I think what we see is that there are so many different technologies in terms of how in all of this information is stored. When you look at imaging, there are a lot of different companies and a lot of different ways that that data gets stored. So I think you talked before about having CDs or discs that you use to kind of carry this stuff around. It's large files. It's We're really in a place where for security reasons, a lot of hospitals and imaging centers want to make sure that that's protected. And so they keep it on separate servers. And so to try to keep that from being hacked and getting any of that information out there about a patient, they spend a lot of time trying to separate it out and then keep it in these kind of secure formats. And so that's something that's made it very difficult for this data to be really, really easily transferred and, and connected. And so that, to your point, is, is one of the things that uh, Bria, the company that I work with, is has solved for. And really the idea is to make sure that there are different filters that we apply to all of this different data to make sure that it stays safe and secure. So in California, for instance, where you are, there are rules about this data that all this data that gets goes from one place to another needs to be de-identified if it's not immediately in the control of a patient. And so there are things that we can do to make that happen, or there are other levels of consent that they can say, I want this piece of data shared with my doctor or with another health system or different folks that be involved in their care. And so some of these types of challenges are things that make it a little hard for the primary hospital or a physician or, or other folks to be able to very, very easily make this data available. And so we, we eliminate some of those challenges and really allow all of the people who are in that circle of care, all the people that are providing that support for you as a patient to be able to work together and collaborate and see that information as though it were right there on their computer in one place. So that's really kind of the first step to making it to making it available. And then when there's there's other tools that are out there that help to make it more understandable. And so I'm, I'm sure Dr. Phillips has a variety of different tools he uses in his office to visualize things and to, to pull stuff together to make it all very understandable and easy for him to work with. But sometimes, because there's so many of these different types of data, there still aren't good tools to be able to do that. And so we're looking down the road at how a lot of that stuff works together and how things happen that are logical and thoughtful so that you get the information you need to make decisions quickly. And so I think those are the kind of things that are that are in development that we're starting to see that are making life a lot easier for all the different people who, who care for patients and play a different role in providing different kinds of understanding or, or different kind of helps to patients as they move through that that different type of care that they get when they're when they're ill. And I know that nurse practitioner Kay, you know, he's been talking about the US. What are some of the challenges that you're seeing in the UK as well? 
In the UK, um, predominantly, they have created the portal, but the only people that actually have access to the portal is the doctors. Um, So if a patient requests their case notes, it can take anything from one to six months to get the case notes. When they do get their case notes, they are just thrown at whoever requests them in a pile of papers in random order so somebody like myself who's 58 years of age there's 58 years worth of case notes um and when i requested mine six years were missing and according to my case notes i don't have any children let alone grandchildren but i do um and i have to pay 30 pounds for a copy of my case notes wow that's incredible yeah that's so, a little frustrating but yeah I- uh, just uh, just a couple of comments real quick, and then we have a question from from Susan. You know, my thoughts on this whole topic are, are, are a little bit different in the sense that we now are getting at, at our institution, we use a health, uh, an electronic medical record where the patients, th- those that are inclined can actually get their information instantaneously. And they often have the inst- they have the information while they're in the hospital before we've even seen it. So I think physicians are having to, to adjust a little bit. Uh, but again, I, at the end of the day, it's all about transparency, and I'm and I'm I'm glad we're moving forward in this direction. Susan is is on the call. You had a question or comment for us? A comment. I'm I'm utterly shocked that um, doctors can't just. Um, I, I hand my phone to any doctor that I'm with if they want to know about a particular test result. I I do have a patient portal, and I read those notes, those after visit summary notes and so on and so forth. But I've also made my daughter my healthcare proxy and, and power of attorney so that if should something should happen to me, she can go ahead and give my my records to anyone. That's a really good idea to have a backup and make sure that there are two of you that if something happens to you, that you need to have someone else. That's really you great do. advice. I, I, I can't recommend it enough. Um, I had it for my mother and it came in handy um, because she she couldn't walk. She couldn't talk. It was. Yeah. You, um, you know, I, 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 I No, I was just going to say I call those folks their consultant because patients here always they always focus on the bad things during that visit. And that's what sticks with them. So it's important to have somebody that's that you're with shoulder to shoulder that's going to help you kind of decipher this this information but but i can hand my phone to a doctor that is going to perform another procedure and he will be able to or she would be able to open up my portal when i gave the password that is not common uh nope. to have a, a patient portal no nope. wow it's not crazy. It just depends on the country. Well, um, coming up right here on the Heart of Innovation, we actually have a special segment. It's called Save My Piggies. And we have a patient who's going to tell her story of perseverance with a disease we've mentioned before called peripheral artery disease. So stay with us. Medical Notepad brought to you by The Way to My Heart in partnership with Cardiovascular Systems Incorporated's advocacy campaign, Take a Stand Against Amputation. How do you be your own best advocate to manage peripheral artery disease or PAD? Hi, I'm Molly Hewitt, Chief Clinical Officer for Patient Education at DigiCare with this week's Medical Notepad. Today, I want to offer seven ways in which you can be your own best advocate to slow progression of disease and prevent life and limb threatening complications. First, schedule annual imaging with your vascular specialist to check your blood flow. It can be an AVI test or ultrasound. For some, imaging may be necessary twice a year. Second, take your socks off at every appointment with your primary care physician, vascular specialist, cardiologist, or podiatrist, and ask your provider to check your feet to ensure wounds aren't developing and blood is flowing. Third, get a referral to a registered dietitian or nutritionist and schedule regular check-ins. Why? What you eat could damage or heal your arteries and diet modifications could help improve your prognosis. Fourth, since walking is the best medicine for PAD, ask your care team about a regimented walking program to help get you on the right track. Walking helps create a natural bypass and reroute flow around blockages. 
If you don't have a formal walking program, ask your provider to work with you on goal setting and accountability. You can also go to thewaytomyheart.org for their free text-based My Steps program. Fifth, schedule appointments twice per year with your providers just to review your medications. Are they working? Do you need blood work to uncover nutrient deficiencies caused by any one of them? Remember, when you make that appointment to ask it at your physician, order all blood work prior to your consult. Sixth, make sure you have a cardiologist who checks other arteries in your body for plaque buildup, especially the aorta, heart, kidneys, and carotids. Even your arms can develop PAD, although it's rare. If you have plaque buildup in your legs, it's likely building up elsewhere in your body. And finally, my seventh tip, get a notebook. Place it by your bed or somewhere it's easily accessible. In it, write down any time you have a symptom that arises, such as claudication sooner than the day prior, or a question you might have for your doctor at the next appointment. Most importantly, if a wound develops, mark down the day you notice it so you can track whether or not it's healing and get to a wound care specialist as soon as you can for evaluation. We are all human, and when we are put on the spot, we sometimes don't have quick recall of everything that matters to our care. The notebook will help you be your own best advocate so you can get the right care that helps you live a longer, better quality of life. It's empowering to be your own best advocate, so take the steps necessary to advocate for yourself. With this week's medical notepad, I'm Molly Hewitt. Chief Clinical Officer for Patient Education at Ditch Care. Medical Notepad is brought to you by The Way to My Heart in partnership with Cardiovascular Systems Incorporated's advocacy campaign, Take a Stand Against Amputation. Remember that the advice and views offered are for educational and informational purposes only. Do not act on any information provided here without the explicit consent of your own healthcare team. For more PAD education, go to standagainstamputation.com. And for real-time support, go to thewaytomyheart.org. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist, Dr. John Phillips. Hey, Kim, guess what time it is? It's time for Save My Keys. Yes. You know, we missed it a couple, you know, last week. I don't think we had one. So I'm really psyched about today's episode. We are um, really fortunate to have Jeanette on the line. Jeanette has uh, peripheral arterial disease. And she's had some some work done on her legs to kind of help some of the symptoms. And, And reading about Jeanette's story, she's... You know, 70 years old, but very active and and so active, I think that a lot of the symptoms that she had were uh, that she thought would maybe related to some of the aerobic activity that that she does, which is not not uncommon. Um, You know, we've talked about peripheral arterial disease and we've talked about the symptoms, but a lot of times people have what we call atypical symptoms. So I always say not everybody reads our textbook as to how they should present. So I'm looking forward to hearing Jeanette's story and and how she's persevered, because, you know, Save My Piggies is about patient advocacy, and it allows patients to tell their story. So, Jeanette, thanks for joining us. How are you doing today? I am doing well and wonderful. I'm frustrated with my computer, but other than that, I'm very well. <laughs> well, who isn't? So, Jeanette, you made it here. You made it here. Tell us a little bit about the symptoms that you were having and, and how you kind of sought out medical attention for them. Well, when I think about it now that I look back, I think it probably started a year ago with my legs hurting sometimes off and on when I walked and I always walk I've walked all my life and I have dogs that I walk every day so I just thought I wasn't stretching enough so I kept stretching more and more and it and it kind of subsided and it stayed kind of at a level that didn't worry me and then it started getting like within a six months ago maybe or so it started interfering with my walks where I'd have to stop and let my legs relax and then I'd go again again I thought it was stretching didn't even think about no, I didn't even dream that I had anything wrong with my arteries. So then um, fast forward, and I started getting chest pains in, I think it was May. And they seemed, this is silly, but I was one night, I ate five 
uh, Ralston Purina crackers, and I remember so vividly. As soon as I ate them, my my chest just seized up, and I thought, oh, my God, these are giving me heartburn. I can't eat these ever again. So I went to bed that night, and then the next day everything was fine. A couple days later, I started getting them again, but I wasn't eating crackers. So I thought, hmm, something's going on. And then it just progressively got more and more, but I always attributed it to heartburn, which I've never had, but I do have Barrett's esophagus. So I thought perhaps it was heartburn because everybody says heartburn feels like a heart attack. So I kind of just poo-hooed the whole idea and kept going about, and then they kept getting worse and worse. Finally, my sister made me promise that the next time I had one, I'd go to the ER. Well, I had gone to two doctors prior to the ER. One doctor said, well, I do think it is heartburn, and I don't, but I told her I had pain going down my arms, and she said, yeah, but I think that's just heartburn. I don't think it's anything to worry about. She listened to my heart, took my pulse, and that was it. So I went away, and then a couple of weeks later, I went back to the doctor, a different doctor, and she said, I think it's your anxiety. And I said, oh, please don't tell me it's in my head. And she said, well, I think it is your anxiety. Nothing's wrong with your heart. And I said, okay, and I left. Two days later. Wow, they did the same to my dad. What? They did the same thing to my dad. So ultimately, what was the catalyst that got you to a doctor that properly diagnosed you, got your heart stented, and then that's when they also found what was going on with your legs? Um, That was when I was... um, it a vo- I was volunteering one morning, and I said, boy, my chest hurts. And my friend said, go to the hospital right now. I said, I don't want to go to the hospital. She goes, go to the hospital. So I went to the hospital, and my blood pressure was 200 over, I don't even know what the other number was. Yeah, they, wow. Everything happened so fast. They got me in there. They gave me three nitroglycerin tablets, and they shoved me into the operating room, put the stent in immediately. I mean, it was like within an hour I had everything done. So, Isn't that so amazing? You got- yeah, you got stented in the heart, and then ultimately they they diagnosed you with peripheral arterial disease, and, and you had some work done on your legs as well? Yeah. he. When I was in the hospital that night, the cardiologist came, and I can't say enough good things about him. He's wonderful. And he was checking the pulse in my body, and he went behind my knees, and he said, huh. And then he went down to my feet, and then he got a Doppler, and he found the pulse, and he said, do your legs hurt when you walk? And I thought, well, how does he know that? And I said, yeah. And he goes, you don't have any circulation in your legs at all. I said, what? And so you went and got, yeah. And so you went and you ultimately got, you know, a procedure and you weren't too happy with the one vascular doctor that you went to. Uh, no, and you I still wasn't. had pain. And so do what made just- you end up, we're, we're short on time. So we got to get to um, exactly how you ended up deciding to get a second opinion. Well, because I came and I talked to you, I I texted you and I said, can you recommend somebody in the Kansas City area? You uh, recommended Dr. Surio. I called him. I went in there and he said, you're coming in next week and we're going to be doing your legs. We're going to rotor-rooter. He didn't say rotor-rooter. I say that. We're going to do your legs and then we're going to do your your right leg first, your left leg second. So I went in one week and he did my right leg and then he did my left leg and he put three stents in my right leg two stents in my left leg and it's made a wow. huge difference and we actually have a special guest here um our special guest do you want to say hello to Jeanette Jeanette hi there this is Dr. Correa how are you doing oh my gosh I'm wonderful how are you I'm fantastic thank you so much you I'm are so my miracle man oh thank you thank you too kind <laughs> And I'm sorry I I'm didn't say that right. For you. I'm, I'm super happy that, that thanks to Kim, you're able to come and see me. And Well, I'm so grateful for the things that we were discussing you. with Kim yesterday was yeah, super well, important to listen to your patient. Two physicians. What was the difference between the two different physicians for you and made all the difference in the world this time with Dr. Korea, Jeanette? Well, the first guy, he just listened to my heart and checked the pulse in my leg and said, yeah, you don't have a pulse, go walk for 90 days and come back. But he didn't do any kind of test to see, like I thought, I'm going to go back in 90 days, but he didn't have anything to base any improvement on. So oh, that's, that's why I was not happy with him. Need- and I did rehab for, I kept doing rehab and it was killing me, but that's when I reached out to Kim. Any lessons, Dr. Korea, that we can learn from this? Well, the first thing is 
this is a systemic disease. So if it's in the arteries of your heart, it's probably everywhere inside your body. That's why it's super important to have that thorough follow through. I mean, I'm happy that when you're in the hospital, the cardiologist took the time to at least check the pulses in your leg, which is great. But then it's super important to put things into perspective and say, you know what? I do have arterial blockage and it's not just peripheral vascular disease. You also have carotid disease. You probably also have coronary disease and all these things need to be evaluated. And as you can tell from what, what we've been in the office, it's very simple. We do those blood flow studies. They take about five to 10 minutes and it's a great screening study to figure out what is it that's wrong with somebody and how are we going to figure it out? I hope your yep. experience at the office has been great, Jeanette. Oh, it's been wonderful. Everybody there is fabulous. I'm well, thank you so to much to the both of you. Yeah, we really appreciate you both being here. Dr. Korea, really nice work. What did you call him, Jeanette? The Miracle Surreal. Man? Surreal. <laughs> I got it all wrong. <laughs> well, thank you, and Jeanette. We really appreciate your, your courage, your perseverance, and, you know, for getting a second opinion that's really huge, advocating for your health and and. We hope you are living a better quality of life now. Um, oh, already I right am. And more. I can't thank oh, you enough, that's Tim. Oh, that is fantastic. Oh. We can't wait to get you walking again. Day about a we'll It's happening already. I think, I think it's happening already now that both legs have been done. Yep, it is. Thank you to both of you for calling <laughs> in with that story. Absolutely. Thanks, and, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be thank back in Thank you for the invite. Just a minute. Absolutely. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist, Dr. John Phillips. Go for it, Douglas. Welcome back, everybody. We have about three minutes left, and we really can't do a show without having Douglas on. Douglas... What is your tip as it pertains to your medic, your health information? How, how do you, how do you get what you need? It's, it's, my tip is uh, very simple is when I walked into St. Luke's, what, 32 days ago, I had every CD that I've had for the last three years from every vascular surgeon or hospital done. And I have three of these that have every record that I've had for the last three years done by a doctor. It took me some time to get it all, but I got it all. So when I walked into the hospital at St. Luke's, I had everything. So like Dr. S you said earlier, Dr. Phillips, when that doctor, Sheffy, looked at my work, everything was right there. Fantastic. Wow. Fantastic. Kim, so well, we got two minutes left. What are your thoughts um, regarding all this information that patients are going to be getting now? You know, I think it's really important that you find advocates such as us. I, there are so many different organizations. For example, I just found one for people with pancreatic cancer. There's pancan.org. They have real-time free advocates for people to help make sense of that information. And with so many people having more real-time access to their information in online portals such as MyChart, a lot of times you're getting the results very, very quickly before you have time for a consult. And so it's really important at that point to talk to someone right away because so many of us get anxiety as we're sitting there looking at it going, oh my gosh, it says abnormal, what do I do? And you can't get a hold of your doctor. At that point, look online, find an advocate. If you have heart disease or peripheral artery disease, you can definitely call us at the way to my heart. Pancan.org, for example, for people with pancreatic cancer. And there are so many others, but find an advocate that can walk you through and become your navigator and help to ease that anxiety, to explain the terminology to you. And that will help make you feel really empowered. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a key because from my side of things, and we were talking about this during the break, yes, patients have access to all their all the documents now, but we as physicians use a language to communicate. And, and I don't think we can, you know, change that in the sense to make it reader friendly for our patients. And so, again, just reach out to your doctor, reach out to the way to my heart or whatever advocacy group to, to help decipher and translate what it is that you're reading, because patients focus on the hazards, as Winston Churchill said, and, and they're not necessarily hazardous. Right. I mean, like, like we, we can work together to get this stuff 
uh, translated and, and, and allow the patient to kind of understand what's going on. I agree. Kay, 10 seconds and take us out. I think it's the best innovation that's going to come to the healthcare market is that the patient has access to their records and understands what's going to happen to them and when it's going to happen. I agree. Thank you so much for everyone for joining us. Join us every Saturday. And in the meantime, go to theheartofinnovation.org. Have a great week, everybody. Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Our mission is to help patients live a better quality of life through comprehensive education, real-time support, and high-touch advocacy in partnership with thewaytomyheart.org and take a stand against amputation. Our purpose is to reduce the 1.5 million heart attacks and strokes and nearly 200,000 amputations annually. For more information regarding topics you've heard discussed on today's program, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. The Heart of Innovation is for educational and informational purposes only, and advice and views shared are not a substitute for medical advice from your own supervising physician. Do not act on any information provided in this show without the explicit consent from your own healthcare team. If you think you are having a medical emergency, call your local emergency number or go to the nearest hospital or emergency room.